All right, welcome everybody. So my name is Jez. I'm the programming librarian here at the Elmhurst Public Library. I'm going to mention a couple of other upcoming uh, programs and go over some housekeeping things, and then we'll get started. So this Thursday at 10.30 a.m., we have our monthly Culture Club presentation. And this time we are learning about Slovenia and Croatia. So uh, Eugene Flynn will be back for that one. We've had him a few times now. We really like him. That evening, uh, so Thursday evening, 6.30, we have our genealogy lab. So if you're interested in genealogy at all, we'll have a professional genealogist here who's going to go over um, some different sites that we have available through the library, and then you'll be able to ask questions and use the computers to do your own research. So you can kind of get one-on-one -on -one help from a professional. So if you're interested, sign up for that one because there is a limited space just because we'll be in the small computer lab upstairs. And then this Sunday from one to three, uh, you can join me for our last plant swap of the season. So you can bring uh, plants as well as, you know, pots, leka, you know, different tools, uh, indoor, outdoor plants, whatever you like. And you can meet with other plant fans and talk about ideas. I'm hoping to get some information on how to bring my plants in because it's getting a little colder now. So you can join me for that one. And then we'll resume those in the spring. So we'll have a little bit of break. Uh, tonight, we are a hybrid program. So some of you are here in person and some of you are watching online. Uh, if you are online, know that we're using the webinar format. That means you can see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. Uh, if you are on Zoom, you can submit your questions at any time by putting them in the Q&A feature. So it's a little button on your Zoom toolbar that looks like two speech bubbles. If you're here in person, if you can just hold those questions until the end. Um, on Zoom, we've enabled the live transcript option. So if you would like to view the captions, uh, click the button on your toolbar that says show captions. If you do not see this button, click more and then select captions. Here in the library, we have both of our assistive listening systems running. So if you would like, I have these devices in the back. You can, um, we'll just turn it on. It's just a matter of turning the volume up or down and it brings the sound a little bit closer to your ear. And if you have the Listen Everywhere app on your phone connected to your own headphones or your hearing aid, you can connect to that through the meeting room Wi-Fi. And I have some handouts in the back on how to connect to that if you've never done it before. And then if you are in person, if you can silence your cell phones, and then if you do need to get up for any reason, just make sure you do so without disturbing the people around you. Uh, I'm gonna close the door in a couple minutes. Uh, if you do leave, just make sure it doesn't slam behind you. It tends to make a really loud click right at the end. And then let's see, a little bit about our presenter. So Ray Johnson is an author, historian, lecturer, and formal criminal investigator. He's the owner and founder of Johnson Research Services and, can, and has conducted historical research for television production companies, documentarians, authors, attorneys, and family historians. He has been featured on Discovery ID, the History Channel, PBS, and the BBC, and has written three books on Chicago history. So please welcome Ray Johnson. All right, we should be good. Everyone can hear me. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks uh, actually to Jez for inviting me. Um, this is this is a fun topic. Um, I, I've always been a big fan of history, except for when I was in school. So I wasn't a big fan then. Um, and obviously from the way you reacted, you know, probably you, uh, you weren't either. So, um, and it wasn't until I got into family history. So I don't know how many genealogists we have out there. Um, then I, I really started getting interested in history itself. And then the stuff really started coming alive. So I wanted to kind of relate everything to my family and where they fit into history. And so all those names, dates and stuff that you couldn't memorize or you couldn't memorize at least for a week in school in order to take the test, and then you forgot it completely, uh, those dates started sticking. So, and then you started discovering things that maybe weren't taught in history class. And you thought, oh, that's really cool. Why didn't they teach us that? Or why didn't they teach us this? So, um, so um, I eventually became a criminal investigator in DuPage County. And when I left that work, I uh, decided to rather, instead of investigating live people, investigating dead people, because it's safer that way anyway. But, and my wife was really happy about that. So 
Um, so this this kind of combines uh, really two of my favorite Chicago topics. One is the White City itself, which is the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. And the other is H.H. H. Holmes. Now, um, how many here knew about H.H. H. Holmes or Herman Mudgett before the book Devil in the White City came out? Okay, so quite a few, actually. Usually we got like three or four people, so usually it's nobody, um, which is great. I mean, it's it's not great in that you didn't know about it, but it's great that Eric Larson's book came out and it introduced a lot of new people to the White City and both to H.H. H. Holmes. Um, now, Eric Larson wrote a great book. There are some, he did take some liberties with some things in order to make it uh, readable, you know, so it read kind of more like a novel than a, than a nonfiction book. Um, but, you know, the, the, it worked and I loved it because it, it combined both the white city on one side and it combined the criminal side of things, you know, so for me, it was great. I love both sides. Some people didn't like it because it does jump back and forth a lot. So you'll go from Holmes to the white city, back to Holmes and then back to Burnham and the crew. Um, but we're going to get into kind of a deep dive into Holmes more than what Eric Larson uh went into so there's a lot that that he had in the book that was true and real and factual uh some of it wasn't but he didn't include a lot i mean there's a there's a lot with Holmes, and we're not actually even gonna have time to get into most of it but we're gonna cover a lot of it so um so this is the guy we're talking about herman webster mudgett was his actual name uh, when he was born um obviously eric larson uh, combined his story along with the white city we're going to talk about some of the um, claims about Holmes and kind of look at what the evidence tells us about that and what it doesn't. Um, so a little bit about Holmes himself. He was born May 16th of 1861. He was executed on May 7th, 1896 at Moyments in prison in uh, Pennsylvania outside Philadelphia. Um, when I started looking into Holmes, um, just trying to find things that hadn't already been published or hadn't already been talked about, um, part of it is you have to kind of dig into what some of his aliases were. So, which is tough because people develop aliases because they don't want you to know who they are. Um, so to kind of combine these names with with the guy we're talking about was a little challenging. Uh, it also gave me a huge headache. And, and part of it is you're trying to think the way he thought back in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and thinking if you were him, what would you do or how would you do it? Because back then there were no ID cards and no, you know, no driver's licenses, that sort of thing. So it was, it was a lot easier to go from place to place, change your name, you know, unless people knew you. Uh, and a lot of stuff was done using notaries. So that was a big thing. So if you, if you were taking something in the court, they couldn't, you know, right now they ask you for an ID or something. Then you had to have something written and notarized saying this is who you were or a letter from someone who, who, who was well-known that could vouch for you. So it was a little different back then. So these are just some of his aliases. I think he had around 27, 28, probably a lot more than what we're aware of. My favorite one is the one at the bottom. I made sure to include that only because he must have been feeling kind of funny that day, you know, came up with the name Waldo Bunkhorn. I have no idea where he came up with that name or why. Um, most of the names on here were taken from people who he had tried to rip off and who caught him and uh, got, you know he didn't quite get away with the con so he used their name in the next con i don't know if it was kind of just a spiteful thing but but like alexander bond that was a real estate agent that he had used one time and so he just borrowed these names uh, usually and some of them were were very common names that were hard to track so um, this is the house where he was born in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Uh, this is from a, a Google map, so this is fairly recent. Uh, it, when you take the Google, Google maps and kind of go around to the side, it, it appears to me like they're going to be building a museum. And it, that, that, I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying that it appears that way because there's a lot of construction, new construction being added to the house that doesn't look like a traditional addition. Um, so it looks like there's going to be a little museum attached to his house, but I could be wrong. Um, but this is the house he was actually born in. It's um, uh, still there. And the uh, the academy where he went to school is still there. It's across the street from the house. It's very close. Um, this is now the, the town hall, or this is where the city offices are now. But the building was, was there when he was there. Um, his first marriage, his first and only legitimate marriage was to Clara Lovering. Uh, that was in New Hampshire on July 4th, 1878. Um, you can see their names there. He was 20 years old. His bride was 18. 
got married by a justice of the peace. And uh, this is a picture of her and uh, the only child they had together, which was Robert Mudgett. Um, so he left her fairly quickly. They got married in 1878. He went to school uh, at the University of Michigan, um, where he did graduate with uh, with uh, a, a degree in medicine. It was a little different back then, and they have quite the standards that they have now. Um, but he did graduate, which is unusual for what people consider to be serial killers. Uh, they generally don't have the attention spans to make it through school or, or anything above uh, grade school or high school level. Um, once he left uh, the University of Michigan, at some point he came to Chicago. The only real record we have of him first being here was when he registered as a pharmacist. So when he came to Chicago, he registered with the, Illinois, uh, the Secretary of State of Illinois as a pharmacist. Uh, there he is under Harry H. Holmes. That's where he got the name. That's where he started his most popular alias of H.H. H. Holmes. Uh, that's the first time, at least the first time we were aware of that he used it. And that was on 16th of July, 1886. So we at least know he was in Illinois then, registered as a pharmacist. Um, I went from there. Now, why did he pick the name H.H. H. Holmes? Nobody really knows. Uh, he didn't admit to any reason why he used that alias. Uh, some people guess it might have been that Sherlock Holmes, the novel, came out shortly before in 1887 was when the when the story of Sherlock Holmes was first published. Did he read it? Didn't he read it? I don't know. Um, he never really uh, told anyone why he used the name Holmes, although even if he did, you really couldn't believe him because if, you know, if his mouth was moving, he was lying. I mean, that's just the way it was. So um, now here's uh, one of the claim I keep hearing all over and over again, and it's used in some of the documentaries and some of the books uh, when people are, you know, trying to uh, talk about Holmes is that he was America's first serial killer. Now, I'm, I'm sure most of you know that's not true, first of all. And, and, and second of all, I don't really consider him a serial killer the way it should be categorized. So while he did kill multiple people, um, most serial killers are driven by that urge to kill. The, 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 the killing is actually the, the end result that they're looking for. And that's what, once they kill someone, they, they feel a sense of relief. And then, then the voices start again and they feel like they have to kill again. Holmes didn't really have a desire to kill. He had a desire to make money and to increase his ego. And that was his driving factor. So he, you know, he could kill someone very easily. He was definitely a sociopath. He had no remorse whatsoever. Um, so for him, killing someone would be like us taking out the garbage. You know, it really didn't matter um, as long as he could make money on it. So traditionally, the the reason he killed was either for money through the use of insurance scams. If you read the book, you're well aware of that, uh, or if you were one of his associates and you learned too much about what he was doing behind the scenes, then you became a liability and then he would eventually take you out as well. Um, so just to give some proof that he wasn't one of the first multi-murderers, serial killers, whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't know how many people have heard of the Bender family. Yeah, a lot of people haven't. A lot of people have. Um, I'm really intrigued why there wasn't more written about them. Um, maybe there was, and I just haven't read it, but the Bender family was uh, operating in Kansas from 1871, at least as far as they know, from 1871 to 1873. They were in Labette County, Kansas, just in the lower right hand or southeast side of Kansas there. And what the Bender family was is, well, the, it's hard to even call them a family. It was a group of individuals who posed as a family in a small cabin in, in rural Kansas. And what they did is, uh, we'll just give you an idea. Pa, the father, the supposed father bender, uh, was born in the 1810s as John Flickinger, as far as we know. Um, the mother, Elvira Bender, was born uh, Elmira Hill Mark around 1815. John Bender was also born under a different name, John Gebhardt. And then Kate Bender was born as Eliza Griffith. So uh, there was a lot going on. And, and this isn't even for sure. This is, this is the best guess that we have. Um, so what they would do is, this is kind of a newspaper um, uh, kind of drawing of, of what, the, what the house looked like, and, and they were kind of serial killers. What they would do is the, a person would be traveling on this rural road, and then they would invite them in for dinner, and then the person would stop and have dinner, and they had this sheet. Uh, you can see the little guy sit at the table there, 
there was a sheet set up behind the table. And when he was eating, someone would come behind the sheet and hit him over the head with a hammer. And then they would take, they would take whatever, whatever stuff he had, you know, whatever he had, all his valuables, and then they would bury him somewhere out, you know, outside the cabin. And they did this for a number of years. Um, this was, uh, once they were found out, this was actually in the newspaper when, when they were finally busted. I, I, and I use busted very loosely because they were never apprehended. Nobody in the family was ever, appreh ever apprehended, which is why I'm, I'm curious why nobody ever wrote a book about these people. But um, but this was kind of a drawing the police did of the layout of the of the uh, cabin and how the you know if you were sitting in the wrong seat you know how you got you know hit in the head um, and then eventually people started you know saying yeah well I had this relative that was traveling along here and the last time we heard from him was here and they started putting two and two together and finally the local sheriff put a posse together they went to the house they were already gone so someone had tipped them off that somebody was on to them. Uh, the family was gone, never apprehended, but they started excavating bodies from outside the cabin. So, um, so yeah, so Holmes was definitely not America's first serial killer, so get rid of that. Uh, the second claim is that he, he scoured the 1893 World's Columbian, Columbian Exposition looking for victims. Uh, he didn't have to do that. There were plenty of young women coming to Chicago around that time. He didn't have to go to the fair to find them, and it was kind of, you know, and I don't even think Larson alludes to the fact that he was he was prowling the world's fair although when you do read some stuff about Holmes a lot of people say oh he was he was at the world's fair looking for victims um that probably would he may have done it uh, first of all it cost money to get into the fair and he didn't he didn't like to pay for anything so he may have tried to cheat his way into the fair I could definitely say that um and one thing about the fair it's it's one thing that I really want to try to find so not to get off on a tangent but with the World's Fair, every state in the Union had their own building at the World's Fair. So they had to pay for it. They had to ship the materials. They paid for the workers to, to, to build it. And um, New Hampshire had or Yeah, New Hampshire had one. And I don't think Holmes would be able to resist the, the urge to visit the World's Fair, go to the New Hampshire building, and sign the, the, the guest book. Because each one of them had one. So as people would go to the different state houses, they would sign the guest book. And some of them still exist. I, I haven't been able to find New Hampshire's. At least it's not in the state of New Hampshire. So somebody may have it. Um, but I would I would love to see if the name Herman Webster Mudgett comes up in the in the logbook because no one's been able to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that Holmes ever set foot in inside the Columbian Exposition. Although what he was doing was going on at the same time as the World's Fair. Uh, the second reason is they had these guys, about a thousand of them, scattered out throughout the, the World's Fair. This was their police department. It was called the Columbian Guard. So it was their job looking for pickpockets and people trying to jump the, jump the gates without paying and that sort of thing and to try to keep the peace. And, um, and they didn't carry guns, but they carried swords. You can kind of see them just off to the uh, left of them. So I'd much rather be shot than stabbed with a sword. That's my own personal preference, just saying. Um, and we had the uh, what they called the Colombian secret police. So these were the undercover guys, the plainclothes guys, uh, actually headed up by by um, John Bonfield. So if you're familiar with the Haymarket riots in Chicago, then you've probably heard of John Bonfield, who was a lieutenant, I think, at the time of the the, the riots, and and is kind of blamed for a lot of the bloodshed, depending on what side of the 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 confrontation you side with with the workers or the police but um a lot of people were killed during during that uh but he left police work shortly after that started his own private investigation firm and then when the world's fair came they made him the head of the secret police so basically it was uh two plainclothes guys from every state in the union from the major cities and they would all gather at the world's fair looking for known criminals in their jurisdictions so it was kind of like you knew everyone by face like these were the frequent flyer kind of things and um and so it was kind of like facial recognition but before computers so you just had to have people looking for people um so they had these guys as well about a hundred of them um so probably he wasn't you know plus we kind of know how he met his wives and and possibility the third one he met uh, or went to the fair with, but uh, claim number three is that there's hundreds of bodies lying under the the current post office at 63rd and Wallace. So 63rd and Wallace 
was where he had what what is popular known as his murder castle. So this was a building that he had actually, well, he personally didn't build it. He had it built. Um, and it was ingenious the way, uh, you know, he was a smart guy. I mean, you, you got to give him credit for being as intelligent, deviously intelligent and misguided. Um, but he was very intelligent in that he had this building built for free. Uh, and the yeah, everyone goes, what? Well, he, he took advantage of a, a little known law at the time that if you hired a work crew to do work for you and you didn't like the work they were doing, you could fire them within a week and not have to pay them. And so basically he just rehired a new crew every week and eventually got his, his building built. And that served kind of two purposes. One is that he didn't have to pay for it. And second of all, not one person knew how the building was constructed. Everyone that came in was kind of, you know, working blind. Um, now, originally when he built it, it was only two floors. Uh, he added the third floor once, once it was put out that the World's Fair was going to come to Chicago. And, you know, he was about making money. It's not that he wanted to kill everyone that came there. Um, there were select rooms, however, that if you were unfortunate enough to maybe, let's say, take out an insurance policy on yourself and, and make sure that Holmes was the beneficiary, that never worked out well for anyone. Um, then you went on the second floor. So there were there were the second floor had special rooms that were uh, piped with natural gas, so that if the person once the person went to sleep, he could turn the gas on in the room until they were dead. And then he had um, uh, kind of like a big dumb waiter, but it was basically a, a chute that went from the second floor to the basement. And that's where they get in Sweeney Todd. I don't know if you've you've seen the play or the movie Sweeney Todd. That's where they got the idea for, you know, when the chair went back and the person was dropped down into the basement, that's kind of where they got that idea from. So he did have a chute that went from the second floor that was big enough to accommodate a human being uh, to be stuffed into it and then dropped into the basement. At that point, um, we don't really know what happened to the person. Um, there's only been a couple bodies found that were related to, to Holmes. Um, he did tend to, as a way of getting rid of the body, he, he taught one of his, Patrick Quinlan was known as the janitor of the building. He did teach him how to, how to strip the, the skin and muscles and everything else from a body and then dry out the bones and articulate them so that you put it together, you know, like a full skeleton. And then you took it to the medical college and they would give you $200, no question asked, which was a lot of money at the time. So he did, you know, so he would collect the insurance money and why let a good body go to waste when you can get $200 for it. So now what happened to the, the rest of the body? No one really knows. So um, now when they, when Holmes finally left Chicago, because he was never prosecuted for any Chicago crimes that he committed, although he, most of the stuff he did in Chicago was related to ripping people off. So the furniture for his building, the windows for his building, anything that went into the building, the safe, the walk-in, huge walk-in safe that he had in his office was bought on credit but never paid for. And when the people tried to come back and get their safe, he said, sure, go ahead. But he built the room around the safe. So there's no way to get that thing out of the room without damaging the room. And he said, if you damage my, my building, I'm going to sue you for more than what the safe is worth. And so they said, fine, keep the safe. So he was, he was a conniver. Um, this was a map that came out in the, um, or a diagram that came out in the newspaper after Holmes had already left and, and people were starting to figure out what he was up to. Uh, this was kind of a layout of what the, the second floor in the murder castle looked like. So uh, it was kind of like a maze, kind of like a, the opposite of a fun house. Uh, now, some of the rooms made no sense at all. Some of the rooms had no doors, no windows. It was just an empty space. And probably because the workers didn't know, you know, didn't know where the left person left off. So a lot of it was probably mistake. But some of them were meant to, you know, there were doors that opened to brick walls. There was, you know, there's all kinds of weird stuff meant to confuse people. Um, now, he did have secret areas that, that, you know, secret doors and whatnot, where he could hide things that he didn't want to pay for. So he was sued over and over again in Chicago for not paying for things. He became friends. He got served with so much court paperwork that he became friends with the sheriff deputies that would show up to serve him with the paper. And they actually liked him. He was they were like a likable guy. I mean, if you're not a likable guy, you're not going to be much of a con man, you know, if nobody likes you. 
So, so they would show up and they would actually tip them off ahead of time and say, Hey, you're being sued and we'll let you know when they're coming to get their furniture or whatever. And so, so they would tip them off and they'd move all the furniture into the secret room and then, you know, hide it away and be like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any furniture. Um, these are the probable Holmes murder victims. Now, the only ones we know for sure are the last four. So Benjamin Peitzel, he's the one, he was one of his former business partners um, who, that's what he hung for. So he was executed based on the murder of Benjamin Peitzel. That's pretty much it. Ben, ben Peitzel was aware of what Holmes was doing most of the time, got to know too much, and he needed to get rid of him. So with Ben, what he said is, uh, and he had a little bit of a drinking problem. Uh, in fact, that's how he was introduced to Emmeline, uh, Emmeline Sagrand, one of his other murder victims. So she was a secretary for the doctor that worked at the Dwight uh, Clinic, which was for alcoholics. And that's where Ben had gone for a while. And then he brought Emmeline back and then introduced her to Holmes. And then she became one of his notaries. And so it was kind of convoluted. But, but Ben, whenever you drink, he would talk a lot. And he said, no, nah, I can't afford to have this guy around. So he told Ben, hey, because his normal, his his usual con was he would befriend a woman, uh, start to date the woman, um, say, hey, we should get married at some point. Uh, but before we do, you know, we should be responsible people. And, and I'll take out an insurance policy on myself and make you the beneficiary. And then you take out an insurance policy, make me the beneficiary. And then we'll talk about getting married. And so that's what he would do. And then the woman would suddenly visit relatives on the other side of the world and never come back for some reason and then he would eventually report them as missing have them you know pronounced dead and then he would collect the money on the insurance policy now with ben he couldn't do that so he told ben um here's what we're going to do i'm going to set you up uh in a business in philadelphia and you're going to open this business and then we're going to burn the business down and then you're you're going to take out an insurance policy i'm going to be your beneficiary you would think Ben, after going through everything, would would put two and two together, but I guess he didn't. He said, uh, "You know, what, I've got access to cadavers. I'm a doctor. I can I can go get these dead bodies. I'll find one that looks like you, shape, size, that sort of thing, and then we'll put that body in there, burn the building down, and then I'll show up and say, oh, my poor my poor friend En is dead. You know, oh, you know, I need the insurance money. And then we'll split it, and then and then you can take off with your family to Europe, and I'll take my half and just go on my merry way. Only, you know, first of all, Holmes never split money with anybody. And so if he said he was going to split money with you, just watch your back. And so so he didn't use a cadaver, he used his buddy Ben and still collected the insurance policy. But, um, but unfortunately, he did kill uh, Ben's three children. Howard was the youngest and two daughters, Alice and Nellie. Uh, it was part of a big plan where the, the Ben's wife was actually in on it. So, so he, he didn't need all these loose ends. He didn't want the wife around. He didn't want the kids around. He didn't want Ben around. So he let the wife in on what was going on. And the plan was the whole family was going to go to Europe and then he would stay here. And then, you know, that whole thing, but unfortunately he didn't, or unfortunately for him and fortunately for her, he didn't get around to killing the wife before she figured out something's going on because I haven't heard from my husband or my kids in a while, and he's telling me they're already in Europe, and I don't buy it. And so that's when she kind of turned him in. And then the Pinkertons went hunting for him, caught him on a, a horse thievery warrant out of Texas, because he did travel a lot, um, and uh, held him there until they had enough evidence to charge him with the crime of, of killing Ben Peitzel. So uh, the other ones are more than likely his victims. They didn't show up afterwards anywhere. So we're thinking they're dead, but the only bodies that were found were that actually were Ben's in the business that he had set up. And the two girls, Alice and Nellie, were found in a trunk in Canada. So he had taken them to Canada and then put them in a, a shipping trunk and then poured, you know, basically, you know, poured, not poured, but pumped natural gas into the trunk until they died. Um, now, the Holmes Castle was torn down in 1938. You'll, you'll hear things that uh, Holmes burned it down before he left. He didn't. Um, it was actually standing. In fact, that photo I told you was from about 1936 from the Tribune. Um, people knew about the building for a long time after Holmes was gone. Uh, finally, in 1938, they tore the building down, put up the post office. Um, 
Now, one reason that there's not hundreds of bodies under the post office is that they, they had excavated underneath Holmes's building uh, for a long time. So once they knew he was murdering people, the police had hired construction workers and, and they went into the into the murder castle and dug up everything and found nothing but garbage, you know, basically chicken. They found bones, but they ended up being chicken bones and just stuff that they had eaten. Um, and the other reason is that if, if you take a, a satellite view of the post office, which is right there in the center, and I over overlaid a uh, Sanborn map on top of it, the murder castle would have been where that red square is. So it, it wasn't exactly on the same location as the post office, but it was, if you were going to dig, um, you would be digging in the parking lot of the post office. So getting into the basement of the post office is going to help you out a lot. Um, fourth claim that Holmes is Jack the Ripper. Has anyone heard that? That they believe Holmes is Jack the Ripper? Okay. Um, I am not, I, I am not a believer in that theory. Um, I did meet, um, Jeff Mudgett years ago. Um, Jeff Mudgett is, is Herman Mudgett's great, great grandson. He contacted me, uh, by email, I believe was the first day. Was, I think it was, I think Facebook was a thing, but it was very early on, early on in its development. And he contacted me because he knew I was a, a big historical thing on the White City. And he said, I, he knew I was giving tours in Jackson Park. And he said, I'm coming to Chicago. Um, I'm Herman Mudgett's great, great grandson. And I want, you know, if, if it'd be okay with you to give me a tour of Jackson Park and kind of show me around because I've never been there. And I, the first thing was like, okay, sure, you're, you know, Jeff Mudgett and sure you're, you know, related to H.H. Holmes. So I did a little genealogy, reverse genealogy. And yeah, sure enough, if, if there was no hanky panky from 1865 until when he contacted me, yes, on paper, he would have been his, his grand, great, great grandson off of Robert Mudgett from the first wife. So, um, so anyway, we met in a, in a very public location of my choosing and, uh, <laughs> I say that jokingly, but come on. I mean, someone said, "Hey, I'm I'm Charles Manson's gr grandson, and I, I'd like to get a date with you." Or so, yeah, no. But uh, so we met, and he brought his daughter, and I brought my wife, and you know, and my gun, and uh, and we walked around Jackson Park, and he was really a nice guy. I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to make fun of Jeff. So, um, but he was, he he had told me at the time that he he was in the middle of writing this book. Uh, bloodstains that he, he did write and I think there's an, another edition coming out but um, the story is is that at least what he told me is that when he was 40 is when he found out that he was related to Herman Webster Mudgett and he said that his grandfather had told him when he was 40 years old and uh, that as soon as he was told that he started having he started getting epileptic seizures and during these seizures he would he would like dream and then and then Holmes would come to him and tell him things in these seizures and and that's when he said that he was told that um that he wasn't executed that that and also that it was Jack the Ripper and that and that he he wasn't hanged in 1896 that it was someone else that was hanged and then he told me that there was a diary he found in um a tackle box I believe it was a, an old tackle box that was in his garage or whatnot, and when it had a false bottom, and when he opened the false bottom, he found a diary that was written by Herman Mudgett, and that the last entry in the diary was dated, his date of birth, which is 1950. And I'm like, really? And I said, and have you shown anyone this diary? And and he said, well, no, I'm, you know, I'm working on, you know, getting with the Smithsonian or whatever. I said, because that would be something if you had that. Um, I've never seen it. I don't know anyone who's ever seen it. Um, but he believed that his great great grandfather was Jack the Ripper. Now it's not such a off the wall theory. I mean, they did theorize that Jack the Ripper was a doctor that had some sort of surgical training. Um, the problem I had with it initially was that the 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 modus operandi or the M.O. of Jack the Ripper is nothing like that of Holmes. You know, Jack the Ripper went around murdering pretty much strictly prostitutes. And, and left the evidence there for the police to find, you know, just basically brutalized their body and left it there and even taunted the police, you know, sending letters and whatnot. Um, and there's other reasons too, but um, so Jeff had, had sold the idea of his great great grandfather being Jack the Ripper to the History Channel. And so they did a whole thing called American Ripper 
on whether or not Herman Webster Mudgett was Jack the Ripper. Now, the producers contacted me mainly because I had done a deep dive in the Holmes, and I know he, that he has gone to England under aliases, not at the same time the Ripper murders were going on. Um, but And then also I discovered an area separate in Chicago where more than likely is probably one of the areas where he got rid of most of the evidence of his crimes, but we'll get into that. So one of the reasons I don't believe that technically he would be Jack the Ripper is that there were five Jack the Ripper murders who uh, that Scotland Yard kind of call the canonical five. These There were more murders than these five, but they believe some of those were probably copycats for what for whatever reason. So these were the five that Scotland Yard just settled on being the only five Jack the Ripper murders by the same individual. So um, all five, with the exception of, of Elizabeth Stride, uh, were horribly mutilated, like I said, left for anyone to find. Um, yeah, body parts were missing, and then he ended up shipping the body parts back to the police, kind of taunting them like, she was missing a kidney, wasn't she? And then they open a box, and there's a kidney in a box sent to the police. So, so whoever Jack the Ripper was, he was a sick individual. Uh, but not operating the same way that Holmes would. Uh, the other thing is that um, if you just do a little bit of research into Holmes, um, his voter registration in Chicago, this is his uh, voter registration rolls from the 1880s and 90s, um, he had registered to vote or actually voted on, um, and that's the address, 60, 701-63rd Street was the actual address of the murder castle, uh, as they call it. And he registered on October 9th, 1888, which would have been uh, right between the fourth and fifth murder, uh, Ripper murders. So it wasn't that easy to get from Chicago to England and back very quickly. So the chances are he was not not there. Now, it's a theory. It was October 9th. The, the murders were the last ones. The last two were Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes on the same night. Elizabeth Stride, they believe, um, that he was interrupted when he was murdering Elizabeth, whoever Jack the Ripper was, uh, because she wasn't really mutilated much. And then there was another victim short, shortly away that was. So they believe that, that there wasn't meant to be two victims that night. Elizabeth was going to be the victim, but someone had interrupted him before he was able to finish. So that's why, that's why he needed to find another victim. Uh, but Technically, could you have gotten from England September 30, gotten back on October 9th, voted, and then shot back to London right away to finish off the next victim? Maybe uh, it takes about it took about a you know a number of days to travel by by ship, possible but not likely. Um, so what I did is I found a location on the Chicago River that was linked to Holmes. Um, in the book, he, he mentions that he installed a furnace in his basement and he would be cremating bodies in this furnace. Um, he might have tried that once um, and then probably fi figured out it was a bad idea because the, the, the house was in Inglewood, so which was very populated at the time. It wasn't like it was out in the middle of nowhere. So if he's burning a body in the basement, it's got to be exhausted somewhere uh, and someone would smell that. Um, I don't know if you've ever smelled... You know, it, it stinks if you burn your hair, you know, I mean, if you can imagine what the smell would be of trying to incinerate a body in your basement and how much that would smell in the neighborhood. He may have tried it once and thought that's this is not a good idea, uh, but he did have one installed. There was a workman that uh, was installing the furnace and was asking questions about why he needed such a high heat furnace in his basement. He said he was going to open a glass bending company, and that was his excuse for needing this. Um, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so so these three, the H.H. H. Holmes, William Green, Henry Rogers, and the warehouse on the Chicago River. So where I came to that was I was, I know Holmes had been sued a number of times. Uh, and you can get all the old lawsuits downtown at the archives, at the Cook County archives. But I always wondered if Holmes had actually sued anybody, which I thought would be really interesting if, you know, and who would it be? And, you know, would he have the the guts to go down and actually file suit against someone knowing what he was doing. Um, and he, he actually did it. Uh, he did it once under the name H.H. H. Holmes. So there's one case. It involved this woman, Julia Connor, and, and it didn't really involve the daughter. But these are the two we believe are, are actual victims of Holmes. So when I went down, 
I pulled the case that listed H.H. H. Holmes as the plaintiff and J.L. Connor as the defendant. And so when I pulled the case, uh, the first thing that was in was, well, it was signed by J.L. Connor, which is Julia Connor. Um, and was, there was an actual um, original promissory note in the case file, which was really kind of cool because normally they're just handwritten copies of an original. They actually had the original promissory note in the, in the case file. And it had um, on the back, H.H. H. Holmes had signed uh, when he was keeping track of how much was being repaid. So to give you that, a promissory note is basically someone saying, I promise to give you this much money at this amount of interest over a certain amount of time. And on the back is where H.H. H. Holmes was um, basically saying how much money was getting repaid to him. Now, he never loaned anybody money. So right away, I'm thinking, what you know, what's the scam? What, what's going on here? And why is one of your murder victims, you know, why would you kill her before she paid you all the money back? It doesn't make any sense. So um, so the only other thing that was in, I did make sure that this was actually Holmes' signature. This was the conf uh, copy of the confession, the bottom one, that was, uh, he was paid to give it, con once he was convicted and was sentenced to die, the Hearst newspapers offered him $1,500 to write a confession so that they could publish it in the newspaper. So he provided the handwritten confession. They paid him the $1,500. The confession isn't worth the paper it's printed on because he lied about the people that he did kill and killed the people that were still alive. So, I mean, people were calling the newspaper after that saying, I'm not dead, you know, I'm not dead. I'm just calling. My family thinks I'm dead. I'm not dead. Um, and uh, so anyway, so it did match the signature. So I know that it was actually his signature on the back. So what was the case about, though? What, you know, and so I got a little bit of hint. There was a one page um, declaration by Holmes as to why he is suing. So basically, he's suing J.L. Connor for the money, which was a little over nineteen hundred dollars. Uh, but it was for the use of William Green and Henry J. Rogers, who are partners doing business as William Green and Company. OK. So I'm thinking of who's William Green, who's Henry Rogers, how does it figure in? So, you know, you kind of had to understand how Holmes operated in his uh, ripoff scams more so than the than the murders. So he would form companies using an alias name and then usually one of his cohorts that's vouching for who he is. So in other words, H.H. H. Holmes would say, I'm John Doe and this is my buddy Jim Doe and he vouches for me, I vouch for him. And you're the poor sap that's got money that we're going to go into business with. And then he would form another company under a different name and then have that company do business with this company and then eventually sue that one company, empty out all the money from that company into his other company. So basically he's just suing himself and, you know, under a different name. And then the poor guy that actually fronted the money for the business is the one holding the bag. So that's basically what he would do. And the, and the mob later um perfected this operation where they would start a business and then and then basically run it into the ground you know in order to steal the money out of the business so um but i don't know if that's where they got the idea from but holmes obviously was was into that sort of thing so what i needed to do is find out who william green is and who henry roger was is is green an alias for holmes um now the interesting thing is that the address of the uh the business was supposed to be 63rd and Wallace upstairs. Okay, there were no businesses on the upper floors of the murder castle at all. Um, Holmes's office was there, and those rooms that you don't want to sleep in were there. Um, but other than that, all the businesses were on the first floor. There was a pharmacy, there was a jewelry counter, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll, I already knew it was bogus at that point. But, you know, again, what's the purpose of this whole, you know, who, how is he making money and how is he benefiting from this? So what I did is try to look up William Green, which is a very common name, uh, probably why he chose it, because it's hard to track. Uh, I did find a William Green and Company in the newspaper that had a warehouse at 544 to 5, or 541 to 5, 544 to 554 North Water Street. So you kind of have to do, um, I found a couple of them, also one with the same address of the warehouse, but with a uh, address of their office. So there was a warehouse and an office. Still don't know if this is the right William Green. So I'm still trying to figure out who William Green is. Um, but I'm going to try to find out where this warehouse existed because it sounded interesting. So uh, if you plot it on a Google map, uh, that's not the actual address because our, the Chicago address has changed around 1909 and 1911. 
So the addresses were shifted. So you have to do a little, little background and, and get the actual address. Uh, on a 1905 Sanborn map, you could see how the shape of the, the Chicago Harbor had, had changed over the years. Um, this would have been uh, right where the uh, star was, would have been where the warehouse was, but it was already gone by 1905. So I had to go a little bit further back. That, that would have been the location of 544 to 554. Um, but when I went back to 1886 in a Robinson fire map, which is very cool if you have access to them, I think they're online, you can find them now. Um, I did find the warehouse there. So it gave you the location of the warehouse, um, where the uh, warehouse was in relation to the river. You can see it was really close. And during this time period, the river ran uh, out to Lake Michigan. So it, it wasn't until 1900 or 1901 that they reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So all the garbage that was going into the river, and people were using it as a garbage dump. I mean, everyone was dumping whatever crap they had into the river, and it would flow out into Lake Michigan, and then come back under the water, you know, and the people would drink the water or whatnot. But anyway, until they decided to reverse the flow and send all the garbage out into the western suburbs, which they were thrilled about that idea. So, um, but this was an outline of the warehouse. Um, so I did find out where it was, and, and when I when it corresponds to about where it would have been today, uh, it would have been right right where those condominiums are. Um, at the would be the modern day location if the warehouse existed today. But again, who is William Green? So I started dig digging into more William Green. So I knew there was a William Green that had a warehouse on the river. Um, didn't know if it was the right one. But then I read an article about a William Green who was being sued by a young farmer boy who was 18 at the time uh, by the name of Gerard Riddle. So this caught my attention because I'm like, okay, Riddle, come on, that can't be a real name. Um, but anyway, um, the story is, is that this Gerard Riddle is suing this William Green. Uh, so I went and got the uh, uh, court case for, for Riddell or Riddle suing William Green. And in the court case, as I'm reading through it, um, it says that Gerard Riddle was a student uh, who graduated from Mount St. Mary's College, which was basically a high school in England. So when you graduated from Mount St. Mary's, you weren't going to be much older than 18 years old. So they called it a college, but it was more like a high school. Um, and he was a student there. And then basically the gist of it is that this guy, William Green, had come to England and had convinced uh, Riddle's father that he was a big farmer out in uh, the US and, uh, and that he can make his son rich and he knew all about farming and we really needed farmers and just allow me to take your son with us to America and uh, we're gonna set him up and you're all gonna be rich. And uh, so I'm thinking, okay, this is smelling more and more like Holmes. But uh, then I saw that in the testimony, it said that they, they came to the United States in the month of April, 1893. So I went and got the ship manifest for that time, and I did a search for Riddle and Green. Uh, I did find a Gerard Riddell, spelled A-R-E-D-D-E-L-L. -L. Uh, the only thing is that he was 31 years old. So I'm like, okay, well, that was the same age as Holmes at the time. That was Holmes' age. Um, I don't think Riddle ever made it to the United States. I think that that William Green is actually an alias for Holmes, and that and that once they got here, they started writing letters back to the father requesting money for the son. Oh, the son needs more money. The son needs more money. The son needs money. I don't think he ever made it back. Um, I did try to trace him back um, and couldn't find him. So I, I think there's probably a body somewhere in England. That's part of the reason that the producers got a hold of me and said, oh, Holmes is killing people in England. Uh, he must be Jack the Ripper. But um, the other person was William Green. So William Green was on the same ship manifest on the same ship. Um, but he was only 28, so it didn't make any sense. The ages were wrong. Um, so who was William Green? Who was who was appearing to be or, or taking the identity of Gerard Riddell? More likely Holmes, so that so there'd be a record of the kid making it to the United States uh, to kind of make the father feel good. Uh, but my guess is that he took uh, Patrick Quinlan was 28 years old. So I'm thinking that he took Quinlan with him to England and, and decided they were going to scam this poor kid, farmer kid. Uh, Quinlan was a farmer, um, so that was his background. So it makes sense that he would have brought him with. Um, now, the other thing is that he mentioned that uh, when they got back to Chicago, that Green had a place in Inglewood. 
which again, you're talking more homes, you know, he had his house in Englewood. Um, and then this was the kicker. He was told that he, by Green that he was working with a guy named Rogers. So now we have William Green and, and Rogers. So, okay, I'm on to the right William Green at this point, which is pretty much I'm resolved to the fact that it was Holmes. But who is Henry Rogers? So there's got to be someone that's got money to lose in the whole William Green, Henry Rogers uh, type of thing. Um, so I started looking and I found another newspaper article that said that Henry J. Rogers of, well, this says Appleton, but it was a typo from Appleton, Wisconsin, provided the money for the warehouse for William Green and Company. So now I know who's the guy with the money. So who is Henry Rogers of Appleton? Um, it also gave it a description of the warehouse as well, which was kind of nice because it gave it the exact location by feet and what sort of river frontage they had. And so this was in the real estate section of the newspaper. Um, so Henry James Rogers was a real person. Come to find out he was a very well-known person in Appleton, Wisconsin. He started a, a paper company in, in Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, his home is a national landmark in Wisconsin and there's a whole society that's meant to, to keep the history of Henry Rogers alive, but they have no idea that he was ripped off by Holmes. So years ago, I contacted him. I said, oh, you're going to like this. I said, uh, how did Henry Rogers, you know, why, what happened to him? Why didn't he move back to, to, uh, to Appleton? And they said, well, he went to Chicago and we think he just gambled all his money away and, and became bankrupt. And I'm like, yeah, no. I mean, he, he may have gambled his money away, but it wasn't at a casino or anything. He was actually working with A.J. Holmes. And they're like, what? And so I went up there and kind of shared what I had. And they were excited but you know hey now we've got a tie-in with H.H. H. Holmes you know more people will come up and be interested in Henry Rogers so this is a picture of his home it's uh really beautiful they um it was the first home ever powered by a uh, distributed hydroelectric Edison generator so uh he used the paper mill to kind of run a generator an Edison generator and so the whole the whole house was powered by hydroelectric power and uh, they still have all the original um appliances you know the electrical appliances which is very cool uh, it was also the architect of the home also designed the wisconsin building from the world's fair uh just a little thing now the rookery building we're going to get to how he's kind of connected to burnham the rookery building if you're most people are aware of the rookery building downtown if you're not beautiful building uh frank lloyd wright you know had had redone the the lobby um this was built by daniel burnham and his partner john root in 1888 um there's daniel burnham there we all know him very well in the chicago area uh chief of construction of the world's fair um also an architect a good architect in his own right uh so daniel burnham had his offices on the top floor the 11th floor of the rooker building with john root um william green company holmes's company had their offices in the same building on the same floor so he would have been known as william green in the rookery building when he decided to go into the office so there is a chance and they didn't have elevators there is a chance that holmes and burnham could have rode the elevator together at some point but he would have known him as william green if he knew him of anything so but they were on the same floor at the same time which was kind of interesting um so you had burnham and, and holmes kind of close together and then you had poor henry rogers who unfortunately after um the business, the business for um, where it comes into the warehouse, they, it was an actual warehouse. Rogers did front the money for the warehouse. Uh, they were, Henry Rogers was supposedly killed by Holmes, according to Holmes's confession. Um, Henry Rogers wasn't killed by Holmes. He, he probably wish he was, you know, when he, when he lost all his money. Um, but he died like three months later after, after Holmes was executed. He died three months later due to liver cancer. Um, but he did die penniless, and his, his, he's buried in a uh, very small graves in Graceland Cemetery. That's him and his wife. So they never made it back to Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, they died here. Um, and so they just done these tiny little stones in Graceland Cemetery. Um, so with the warehouse, uh, it was it, the, the warehouse was meant to be a um, storage facility, and they stored cement. So there are receipts where Henry Rogers paid for two, like a quarter million dollars in their time worth of cement was shipped to this warehouse. Now, Holmes never built anything. 
Um, as far as we know, they never sold any of the cement. Um, but if you're killing people in Chicago and you've got a lot of cement and you're really close to the water, I'm just saying, could have happened. So, um, so the producers were really interested in that theory because, you know, the post office, not going to let you dig under their post office. So, um, so they actually hired a, uh, and you could watch, if you see the, the, they still show the, the show on the history channel every once in a while. Um, so they hired a, a group that was a salvage group to go out on a boat. And we went out there in one of the episodes. And the idea was, um, were there going to be any bodies at the bottom of the Chicago river now? My, my guess is there's more than one, but, um, but my question to the salvage guy was nobody wanted to get in the river, first of all. So they didn't want any dive. Nobody wanted to get in a dive gear and go down because they didn't really trust what was already in the river. So the idea was to send a, a robot down there with a camera. Okay. So we get on this boat and, uh, yeah, that's the boat that we're on. We're taking pictures. So. Uh, that's me. That's Amaryllis Fox. She, Jeff Mudgett and her were the team, the the investigative team that was traveling around trying to figure out if home if uh, Mudgett was Jack the Ripper. Uh, the guy to the right there is the owner of the salvage company. And before we went out there, we were kind of talking to him just by the way. And I said, okay, I said, if there's something sizable that was thrown in the river 130 years ago, I said, what, what are we going to see at the bottom of the river? And he said, well, first of all, there's no current in the river, hardly in there. There never was. Even when it was flowing into Lake Michigan, it was a very slow moving river. When they reversed the flow, it got even slower. So it's, it's almost like stagnant. It doesn't move much. So there's not a lot of stuff being moved around in the river. And there, he said, there's about four to five feet of, of silt, which is basically just really mucky muck stuff that you can sink in. So if you go down in the river and you touch bottom, you're really just going to start sinking into this muck that exists on the bottom of the river. And I said, so we're not going to see anything. And he said, well, if, if anything big was dropped in 130 years ago, it would eventually settle. And then thing, the silt would start to fill in. And he said, you would see probably something that would look like a crater, like a moon crater. You know, you wouldn't see the thing that was actually dumped, but you would see evidence that something of some size was dumped and, and it would form a crater. And we're like, okay. So we'd send the robot down and then we start seeing these so there's all these craters where the warehouse was in the bottom of the river so it was kind of like a, a really unplanned reaction so we're looking at the screen and we all just sort of went no and we're like well that could be anything you know it could be a piece of the building or whatever so anyway that they didn't go any any further well they did i'll tell you about that in a minute but um claim number five was that holmes escaped execution so this that that when he died he had somehow taken the fifteen hundred dollars that hearst newspapers had given him and paid off some poor guy that was scheduled to die anyway and said you know you're gonna be me and then they're gonna hang you and and i'll send this money to your family or whatever so that's the plan at least the theory of what happened with home and it was kind of jeff's theory too that you know he lived a long time after you know um so this is his booking photo when he was arrested in uh, Philadelphia for uh, killing Ben Peitzel. Um, and then he was supposedly hanged. Newspaper said he hanged. The, the detective that arrested him saw him hang. So, and there were about 300 people watching him hang. So it would have been really hard to pull this off. But, you know, we'll just say maybe he did. So um, when he or somebody else, whoever it was, was hung, hanged, um, they were buried in the Catholic cemetery close to where the prison was. So Holmes was not Catholic, but he converted to Catholicism while he was in prison so that he could be buried in a, in a regular cemetery and not in the regular, like, because you would go into the pauper's area of the prison, and he didn't want that. He wanted to be in a regular cemetery. So he converted to Catholicism uh, so that he could be buried in a Catholic cemetery. And he's buried, buried in an unmarked grave right around this area here. Um, and his, his wishes were that his casket be filled with cement, uh, his body placed in there, the casket filled with cement, and then lowered into the ground, and then cement poured into the hole in the ground because he didn't want people digging him up and stripping his skeleton and selling him off to a medical college. So, so that was his wish anyway. So um, 
So when I was doing, when I was doing some research in the homes before I had met Jeff and this whole theory was out there, um, I had found an old using Google books, which is a great thing to do. They're really good at digitizing things. And I just happened to find an article by the journal of the American Medical Association and Holmes had undergone a medical exam while he was in prison for the, for the murder of Heitzel. Uh, and the guy that did the examination was actually a dentist. You know, I don't think they really care who's going to examine the guy who's going to die in a month or so. So this dentist from Chicago actually goes to Moyo Mensing, does this full medical workup on Holmes, which it's a fascinating article. If you do, you, it, you could search for it on Google Books. It's great. So one, because he was a dentist, probably, he did a, a full upper and lower cast of Holmes's teeth. And he did a whole tooth exam, a head exam. He, he examined every part of Holmes. Uh, for the bumps on his head, because phrenology was a big thing back then, and they thought that you could determine if someone was going to be a criminal or insane based on if you had certain bumps on your head. And so they examined his head, and he did have like an indentation on one side of his head, but he said it was because he was hit with a brick when he was 30, so which might explain a lot, but I don't know if, if that's true. Um, so anyway, I kept these in my back pocket during the, the filming of this because Jeff said, we're going to exhume homes, okay? So it was a big to-do. You had to contact all the living descendants and make sure you had to clear it with the Catholic Church, you know, that you can exhume the body. And so there were a lot of hoops to jump through. Finally, we get to go ahead to dig up his body. So we go to Holy Cross Cemetery. We start we start digging. This is the where we're actually digging in, in the ground. Uh, he had purchased two plots, so side-by-side -side plots, so for himself, using some of that Hearst money. You know, he purchased two side-by-side -side plots. So an oversized plot, um, presumably for all the cement that was going to get poured in or whatnot. So we start digging. We're expecting to run into a whole bunch of cement and have problem going. But no, there's no, we just kept digging, dirt, more dirt, more dirt, more dirt. And then finally, there's a, there's a wooden box. Okay, we figured, yeah, nobody's going to go through the trouble of filling the thing with cement because... The guy's not going to know anyway, and it's an extra cost or whatever. So we figured, okay, they just threw the box. They open up the box, it's empty. Exactly. So that's that's kind of the reaction. Of, Jeff is dancing. Ooh, you know, the box is empty. So someone goes, let's keep digging. So they take the box out. We keep digging. We hit cement. We chisel through the cement. It's only about an inch thick. And we find a body. Okay. Now, is it Holmes? Is it not Holmes? That's the thing. You know, did he pay somebody off? So the idea is you get DNA from the skeleton, send it off to King's College in London, where they're going to do DNA analysis and see if the body is related to Jeff. Um, but just in case, see, here's the thing. If there was no hanky-panky in 1865, and Holmes actually did have a baby with Clara Loveling, and there was no hanky-panky between Robert Mudgett and Jeff, then yes, the DNA should match Jeff. But if it doesn't, okay, that just means that Jeff isn't biologically related to Holmes. It doesn't necessarily mean that Holmes is or wasn't hung and it was, you know, something he got away with. So it was kind of a, a win-win no matter what. But um, so we managed to dig him up. Um, there's the upper part. He still had uh, the part of his mustache on that was attached to the top of the skull. Um, so we knew at least the guy that, you know, supposedly hung had a mustache too. But um, so, but what we did is, is once the DNA came, you know, there was a big thing about the DNA not coming back. And Jeff was saying, oh, it was, there was a problem with it. And it might've been contaminated using some of his DNA and blah, blah, blah. So then I, I brought out the, the, the casts of his teeth and it matched the skeleton exactly. So it was actually, and that exam was done in January of 1896 while he was still in prison, not after he died. So um, so it ended up being Holmes and the DNA did finally come back and say he was related to Holmes. So, but it was actually Holmes that was in the, uh, the ground. Um, now, when the doctor was also evaluating, they said he looked so bad at the time, he probably had tuberculosis and probably wouldn't have li lived much longer anyway. Um, so I doubt he would have made it to 1950. Um, now, other links in Chicago, we'll go through this quickly. Um, he had multiple businesses running in Chicago, aside from his little hotel on 63rd and Wallace. 
Uh, this BP uh, that's on the corner, he wasn't in the gas station or anything, but this BP that's in the corner now of um, uh, IDB Wells Drive, formerly the Congress um, in Dearborn was uh, the Monon building. So they had to destroy these buildings in order to widen uh, for the expressway and for Congress Parkway. Uh, but he had a business on the fifth floor, the seventh floor of the Monon building um, called the ABC Copier Company. It was uh, probably the closest thing he ever had to a legitimate business. Ended up catching a lot of intelligent people and ripping them off. Uh, so what he did is there was a guy named Frederick Nind who went to England, bought a patent for a copy machine uh, called the Hectograph. It was just a patent. It was just the, the plans. It had never been made. Um, so this guy who was a friend of Thomas Barber Bryant, who was also um, provided, the, he was big in the real estate, provided, uh, 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 well, you're probably real familiar with Thomas Barber Bryant now. If you're from Elmhurst, you're, you're familiar with him. Uh, he lived in Elmhurst um, for a while. And um, so he had uh, this assistant, went to England, the assistant came back, somehow got mixed up with Holmes. So Holmes wanted to buy this patent from Nin. Nin went to Brian to get the money, you know, to kind of do everything. And then Holmes wrote a bad check, basically, to Thomas Barber Bryant. So he bought the patent, brought it back, and then opened this company to sell the sales territory for this copier that hadn't been built yet. So it was meant to make copies of large engineering drawings. So to architects, this, this would be a big deal. You could make quick copies without having to recreate blueprints. Um, so this is kind of, this is what a hectograph actually looks like. This would be a smaller version of the, the patent that Holmes had. Um, so Holmes created this bogus office inside this building. And anytime he had someone interested in buying the sales territory for this newfangled uh, copier that he was going to have shipped, quote unquote, to the US, um, they would get the the specific and uh, the uh, exclusive sales tour territory. And he would sell this person the exclusive sales territory for this copy machine. So he'd invite all his notaries and friends and cohorts and they'd all man this office and then make it look really busy for the poor guy that's gonna come in and buy this. You know, he sees all this work being done. He goes, wow, these things are flying off the shelves. Yeah, sure, I'll give you, you know, $1,000 for this sales territory. And the next person, they would just sell the same sales ter territory. So. It never existed, but um, so he ripped off Henry Ives Cobb, who also did the the uh, uh, Chicago Athletic Association building downtown, the Fisheries Building for the World's Fair. He ripped off George Pullman. So I mean, these were all big, you know, intelligent people that got ripped off by Holmes, uh, all from the ABC Copier Company. Yeah, you know, there's the Fishery Building at the World's Fair. Uh, he ripped off George, or tried to rip off George Kimball Glass Company. That building is still there. Uh, this is the auditorium building. The building directly behind there is now a hostel. Um, but this was the George Kimball Glass Company at the time Holmes is, uh, that Holmes was there. And he was trying to buy the glass for his murder castle from Kimball. And Kimball didn't trust him and wouldn't sell him the, the windows. Uh, so uh, shortly after uh, he didn't sell him the windows, there was an explosion at the, the Kimball Company. And uh, the ABC Copier Company had a whole bunch of glycerin that they purchased from another company. They didn't pay, pay for it. Eventually, there was a lawsuit. But Holmes was tinkering with explosives because it was kind of a neat thing. You know, it was during a very tumultuous time with unions and, and workers and things were getting blown up all over the place. And I think Holmes was kind of interested in doing that. But I'm not saying he did it. It was never proven, but it blew up at least one floor. Uh, the Tyler Hippock Glass Company uh, did get ripped off. This is Lewis Hippock. So this is a glass company that did sell him the windows for the for the murder castle. And there is a lawsuit when he refused to pay for uh, the windows. Uh, I go back to the, I called the Hippock family probably the most cursed family in Chicago way before I even knew that they got ripped off by H.H. H. Holmes. Um, so... Before, uh, after they got ripped off by Holmes, there was a couple of negative things. But then in 1903, if you're familiar with the Iroquois Theater fire in 1903, so Hippock's two sons were killed in that fire. So um, this is just some photographs from the fire at the time. Uh, killed a little over 600 people. Uh, a lot of uh, codes changed having to do with theaters after that fire. Um, this is uh, Jean Hippock. This is Louis Hippock's daughter. 
So Jean and her mother, Ida, uh, went on a year of, after the sons died, and then the mother was very depressed, and there was a lot going on, and, and she thought that it would be good if she took her daughter, Jean, on a European vacation just to kind of get her mental health back. And so they went to, uh, they went to Europe, uh, Fran England, France, uh, and then they bought tickets back on April 10th, 1912, uh, on the steamship Titanic of all ships. So, so Ida and her daughter were, yes, they booked one of the, la two, two of the last first class tickets in the Titanic. They, they managed to just swoop in and grab the last two. Um, they left from France uh, is where they boarded. Uh, now both of them lived. So Ida and Jean both lived. They were survivors as a lot of the first class passengers uh, tended to survive more than the others. Um, and when she got, I talked to some relatives of the Hippox because it was just such a fascinating family and uh, talked to one of the uh, grandsons of Jean Hippox, the daughter. And after she had got back from, uh, they tell the story about John Jacob Astor, who was on the, the Titanic and he was giving up his, all the guys were giving up their life preservers because they weren't allowed to get on the lifeboats. And then uh, Astor supposedly gave um, Ida his uh, hip flask of whiskey to take with her on the on the lifeboat since they were going to be out in the cold water or whatnot. I don't know if that's true. They said they, they, it was never handed down in the family. Um, but Jean later on uh, was very adventurous um, and kind of a little bit ex eccentric, according to her grandson. Um, she was well known in the neighborhood. She moved to Massachusetts after they they gotten back had a couple failed marriages, um, but then she decided to live alone with a bunch of dogs. So she was always with a bunch of dogs and she always drove and she was a terrible driver and people would see her coming down the street with a car full of dogs and and like try to get out of her way and she would crash with the dog. It was, it was a mess. But they said that she was never afraid to get on a ship after that, after the Titanic. And I said, well, why, why wouldn't you be afraid to get on a ship? And she says, well, I've always, I've already been in the worst maritime disaster that we know of. So what could possibly go wrong? You know, but she wouldn't get on an airplane. She refused to get on an airplane. So ships, no problem. Airplanes, not so much. So the Siegel Cooper Company, uh, the building is still there. This is where Holmes met his third and I guess his final wife, the third that we know of, Georgiana Yoke. So he he married a woman, Berta, uh, Myrta Belknap, once he came to Chicago. He tried to divorce his first wife, Clara, and accused her of infidelity with one of his classmates at the University of Michigan. Um, but he never followed through. He filed the divorce paperwork. It's there. You can get copies of it. Um, but he never followed through. He never completed it. So they were still legally married at the time that he met Myrta Belknap, married her. He, all the, you know, the odd thing is that the women that he actually married, he didn't kill. It's really kind of strange. You know, you'd think, you know, that he would, but he didn't. He Myrta just, he had a daughter with Myrta Belknap. She, they moved to Hinsdale after all this happened, and then and then she went on. The daughter went and became a teacher during World War One to the troops. You know, it, interesting. But um, but he never killed his wives. So Georgiana, he took out to Denver, married her in Denver, uh, Colorado, came back, and then things started falling apart. So um, so she didn't spend a lot of time with Holmes, uh, and actually testified against him in the court case because she didn't really trust what was going on. Something was funky. And uh, she was a, a pretty tough woman. She had come to Chicago as a teacher. She was a teacher in Indiana. Uh, came to Chicago during the World's Fair to find a better job. Ended up meeting Holmes at this store, Siegel Cooper store. So she was working there. She met Holmes there. Um, and then, you know, had gotten married. But the building is still there. It's pretty cool. It's, it's now it's the Robert Morris Center. Um, but it's it's still the building. And just on the other side of that building is like the Kimball Glass Company. So, um, you know, a lot of links to homes. Uh, Palmer House is the final link to homes uh, that we're going to talk about. There are more. Uh, but in his confession, and again, half the stuff that he's talking about is a lie, but but he he mentions William Green in his confession. Only he said he can't mention his name because he'd get in trouble. So he just called him the Englishman whose name I can't, like, he's, he's going to be hanged. Like, how much trouble can you get in? But he didn't want to say the name. He just said, I was working with this Englishman in, in Chicago, and we killed this guy named Henry Rogers. And so he went into the whole thing about how he killed Henry Rogers. 
even though Henry Rogers was still alive. Um, but he said Green was a gambler and, and, a, and a terrible person. And Green is the one that committed a lot of these murders and he tried to talk him out of it. But um, so Green supposedly was a gambler and went to the Palmer house and uh, gambled away his coat and his wristwatch and all this other stuff. This is all in his confession. Um, so more than likely, this would have been a place that Holmes would have hung out. So uh, all the people who had money that were either traveling through Chicago and most of them staying in the hotel were just kind of traveling through and really didn't know. Uh, he could easily introduce himself to people at the hotel since he didn't really have to have a room. He could just walk into the lobby and they had card games going on and he could just sit down and drink and meet people. Um, my question is, you know, who actually uh, won at cards against Holmes? I, I, I still never figured it out, but um, but anyway, so the Palmer House is, is like I said, he mentions killing Henry Rogers. Uh, the Palmer House is really cool. It, they were going to shut it down um, during the, you know, shortly during the pandemic because of monetary issues, but I, I believe it's back open again. Um, but there's only one thing. This is the third incarnation of the Palmer House, the one that's there now. The one that Holmes would have visited would have would have been on the same location, but just a different uh, look to it, like in the first picture. But this particular statue is still there. And this statue is from the second Palmer House um, that's by the elevators. And it's a, a statue of uh, Bellerophon. I didn't know who that was, so I had to look it up. So it was basically a, a, a hero. Bellerophon was a, a hero that had killed the Chimera, which is like a combination of a snake and a and a wolf and a lion or, or something and and killed it while riding pegasus and so it was a kind of a greek mythological uh person but holmes would have seen that statue in the palmer house but all right any questions and there's a lot more links there's a lot more to talk about in holmes we just don't have enough time but go ahead um According to Holmes, he did. So the question is, did he ever practice medicine or or any sort of pharmacy? Was he a pharmacist at some point? Uh, according to some people that, again, in Vermont, supposedly he had a pharmacy in Vermont for a short period of time. Once he graduated in Michigan in 1884, he went back to teach in Vermont, supposedly. And they, they do have records of him being a teacher. So he went to be a teacher in Vermont. And then he had opened a small pharmacy in Vermont, but it wouldn't have been open for long because he was already within two years, he's already in Chicago. So again, you know, he did set up a pharmacy there. He did teach there how well he did. Nobody really knows. So he is buried at Holy Cross Cemetery in Philadelphia. So he's buried, he's buried outside of uh, the, what used to be the Moyamensing prison. Um, so once he was was hung, they had taken his body to Holy Cross Cemetery, which is in Philadelphia. Um, so he was he was executed in Pennsylvania, uh, in Philadelphia, in or near Philadelphia, and that's where he's buried. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. What about his family? That's a good question. So um, I didn't really, you know. I've always wanted to uh, find a probate file for Holmes, and I, I believe it's there. Uh, I've contacted uh, Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia to see if, if there's a probate. They claim that there's not. I can't see how there wouldn't be because he, he was pretty explicit with his, um, the probate would kind of tell, you know, who his heirs were legally and who got what property and whatnot. Um, but a probate is also for people you owe money to, and he owed money to everybody um so if if like in the newspaper it came out that he was getting paid by the hearst newspapers fifteen hundred dollars for this confession you better believe there's going to be a lot of people showing up you know putting a claim in against his estate so there's almost no way for there not to be a probate and he did not want a will so he told his attorney while he was in prison i do not want a will i'm never going to have a will then that itself would would kind of almost cause a probate but when i contacted phil i'd almost have to go there to see if i could find it because they said they don't have anything under herman webster mudget or hh H. holmes you know but i'm sure it exists somewhere any other questions anything online nothing huh i guess i guess i was too thorough
There's there's probably a lot that's been inspired by Holmes. Um, I know you know the American Horror Story did a whole thing called Hotel. Um, one of the seasons was about the hotel that was kind of loosely attributed to to Holmes. Although there were a lot of serial killers that showed up in the episodes. Um, again, Sweeney Todd um, borrowed a lot of the stuff from the Holmes Castle as part of the their kind of layout for the uh, story um i'm sure i'm sure i mean it was it was big news at the time so i'm I'm sure that a lot of people were in, inspired kind of a weird word but inspired by h.h H. holmes You're welcome what was her name yeah bell gunnis yeah bell gunnis i think is what you're talking about yeah she went she it was kind of the it was kind of the almost the 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 reverse of Holmes like the, the kind of a gender reversal because she was killing uh, individuals kind of the same in the same I wouldn't say in the same fashion but with the same idea that you know she'd make money off off of the uh, I know I found I was doing some research in Joliet for for something and they believed that she'd actually killed some people from Joliet as well um, there I think everyone that had a missing bachelor at some point kind of assumed that maybe maybe they were a victim of bell gunnis but that yeah yeah that's the thing i mean that's what kind of got holmes too is that he got a little bit sloppy because initially he was looking at women that were separated from their family and so a lot, and, and there were a lot of women that were coming to Chicago at that time looking for work that were coming on their own. And there were ads all over for, you know, women that work as secretaries or whatnot, teachers, you know, there was a lot, there was a big need for um, workers in general at that point. So, um, so he had plenty of, of people to choose from. I think where he kind of messed up is that with the Peitzels, he'd gotten to be too close to them he kept them around for a little bit too long where he knew the wife and the kids and and so even though he knew he had to get rid of them it was a little messier because you had a whole bunch of people that kind of knew what was going on so he managed to get rid of everyone but the wife and that's who eventually turned him in all right <laughs> Let's see. I think just in Cook County, there's um, the last count. There's a, a they get 800 cold cases a year. Um, yeah, that's Cook County. Not I don't know how many in Chicago. These are murders. Yeah, yeah. These are actually people that hit what they're aiming at, or you know, or strangle or stabbed or whatever. But they're actual dead people, you know, involved. So they're actually murders involved that are gone cold about 800 800 a year so and that that by cold i mean it's usually about a year after the the case is open if uh because we all watch 48 hours right you know that the you know the 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 uh the chances of solving something you know three months from now six months from now a year from now it kind of goes cold and you've got a whole batch of new murders that you're more likely to solve and so you can't spend as much time on the older ones and they eventually go cold so but i think it's about 800 a year you get get added to the cold case files in cook county so. there was there was a See that I looked at that. I, you know, I looked at that, and it was mainly for the producers. I was doing a lot of extra work for them that I probably, you know, did, you know. But they were like, "Hey, do you think you'd be able to find, you know, similar victims of Jack the Ripper in Chicago at the time Holmes was here?" And I said, "Well, you got to look through the corners 
inquest records and kind of do that kind of search. Um, and it was interesting. I mean, it, I didn't see any that stood out. I mean, there there were a lot of unknown women that ended up in the river and a lot of unknown people ending up in the lake, which is generally speaking, probably started in the river and made their way to the lake. And a lot of them were from the year before. So, you know, they'd fall in the river, it, things would get cold and freeze over and they wouldn't find the body until the next year, you know, when things thought out. But, um, but there are quite a number of unknown people that were fished out of the river and some of them were female. Um, but they deemed a lot of those being suicide or drowning or whatnot. They weren't chopped into pieces or, you know, anything like that. Um, there was a number of people, which I was kind of shocked by, that they said cut their own throats, which is kind of an unusual way to, to, to check out. But um, especially when these people were found with a gun on their persons and a razor. So it's like, that's the way they chose to do it. It's very, I mean... It's kind of difficult to to cut your own throat, you know, it, to the point where it would kill you. I mean, you got to go pretty deep, and uh, generally speaking, shock would set in before you'd get far enough to finish the job. But not to get not to get not to get not to get really gross or anything. But we are we are talking about Holmes and Jack the Ripper, so I guess you know. But um, but yeah, so we, nothing ripperish you know that i could find but but then again jeff always said that um because we argued about the the mode of operation and uh, and he knows i i don't buy the jack the ripper thing and we kind of joke around back and forth but um he said oh the curse of the the mo curse of, of the modus operandi and i said i said what do you mean and he said well he says what do you think a serial killer does on vacation so it was his thing that Holmes operated one way in Chicago and he was so careful not to get caught that it all bottled up inside of him and that he would have to go to England and kind of unleash his inner serial killer and then murder a whole bunch of women and have just have a whole bunch of fun and come back six months later and finish what he was doing here so it's kind of like a vacation for Holmes you know he could he could you know but anyway so I but we don't know who Jack the Ripper was technically so i guess it could be hh H. holmes but all right any more questions all right i guess we're done then do you have anything else that you wanted to put out okay well thanks for coming thanks for everyone online <laughs>